In this lecture, you'll learn about object storage, which is another third type of external storage. It's not SAN or NAS, it's a completely different type. You'll often find it being offered by cloud service providers, but there's also on-premises platforms available as well. Okay, let's get into it. It's easier to explain object storage if I give a review of our SAN and NAS storage first, and then we can compare the three different storage types together, and you'll see why there was a need for object storage and where it fits. So starting off with our block storage. With block storage, it stores and manages data in blocks. That's why it's called block storage. And they're accessed via low-level protocols using SCSI and NVMe commands. SAN protocols provide block access over a network, so it's not directly attached to that particular machine. The experience for the user and or applications that are using block storage is similar to using a local disk inside that actual computer. The direct access to the data reduces overhead by minimizing abstraction layer. So there's not additional overhead running on top of that. It uses low level access. Higher level tasks such as multi-user access, sharing, locking, and security are not handled by the block level access with the low overhead. So that needs to be handled by the operating system. Metadata. Metadata is data about other data. You'll see some examples of what this actually is when we get onto NAS in a minute. There's no storage side metadata associated with the block, only its address. So again, very little overhead with our block storage. The block is simply a chunk of data that has got no description, no association, and no owner. Very simple. Where would we use block storage? Well, block storage is considered the best solution for performance-sensitive, transactional, and database-oriented applications. Because there's very little overhead, you can get the best performance with block storage. It's mostly used for primary storage, so not secondary storage like backup and archiving of data. So primary storage, which is going to be accessed frequently, with the client and the storage system both located in the same physical location. Again, because performance is important, we don't want to have a lot of distance between them because that would add to the latency and harm the performance. Okay, so that was block storage. Next, let's talk about our file storage, our NAS. So file storage used by NAS protocols like SAFES, SMB, and NFS, that stores data as a file hierarchy in a file system. That's why it's file storage. The hierarchy is similar to a physical file cabinet like you would find in an office with folders also known as directories and subfolders also known as subdirectories. The user or application connects to the file system through a share if it's SIFS SMB usually used by Windows clients or by mounting an export with NFS which is normally used by Linux or Unix clients. Both all the protocols are supported by the different types of clients. So, okay, file system metadata is recorded separately from the file itself and records basic file attributes such as the file name, the creation date, who the creator is, the file type, like is it a PDF or a Word document, the most recent change, and when it was last accessed. So you can see what metadata is. It's not the data itself. It's not the actual file. It's data about the actual data in the file. With our NAS file systems, the metadata is fixed and standardized to that particular file system. So it's always the same type of metadata that you're going to find there. You can't add to it. You can't customize it. Well, you can. You can add custom metadata, which is known as extended attributes, but that would require you to build a custom application and database or the vendor to have that. So it adds a lot of complexity not normally done. Where do we use file storage? It's well suited to general purpose data, especially data which is edited frequently and data which is concurrently, so at the same time, accessed by multiple users or applications. So for example, if you've got a Word document 
that is getting constantly updated by different people, then file storage NAS would be perfect for that. It's designed to be accessed over both the local network and remotely as well. Performance is not typically as much a concern here as it is for the SAN protocols. So it's common that users can be accessing that data both in the same building and also maybe over a wide area network. Okay, so that was a summary of our block and file storage. So let's talk about some limitations that apply to them now and you'll see why there was the space available for object storage. So our block and file storage systems can be scaled out by adding more disks to the system or adding more nodes to the system. So the actual rack to that actual storage system can be added to, but they're typically limited in scale. There'll be a maximum size for that single system, and it's usually limited to a single geographic area as well, like a single building. You normally cannot have it spread across multiple locations. Also, NAS file index tables, which are our inodes, have a maximum size and can affect performance if they grow too large. So with NAS file systems, the bigger they get, that can negatively impact the performance. Another limitation is for both block and file stores, they need to be backed up off-site for resiliency. Because the storage system is in the one physical location, if there's some kind of natural disaster, like you have a flood or a fire, it would all be gone. So you need to back up the data to a separate physical location in case that happens. Okay, so now let's look at object storage and where that fits in. The way that object storage works, it organizes information into containers of flexible sizes, it can be different sizes, which are referred to as objects. So whenever you put anything into object storage, it's known as an object. Typically that will be a file, like maybe a photo or a video, something like that. When you put that in object storage, it's an object. Your objects are stored and managed in a flat organization of flexibly sized containers called buckets or containers. So buckets and containers means the same thing depends on the particular platform you're using, which terminology they will use. Often it's called buckets. Buckets can span multiple nodes in geographic locations. So that's a big difference between our object storage and the SAN and the NAS. Object-based storage architectures can be scaled out and managed simply by adding additional nodes, which can be across multiple locations. So that's a big difference. And a huge benefit of object storage is the scalability. It can grow out to massive sizes. And the bigger it gets does not negatively affect the performance. It's very commonly offered by cloud providers. The best known example of object storage is S3 from Amazon Web Services. So often very commonly offered by cloud service providers, but there are also on-premises solutions and hybrid solutions as well. A hybrid solution would be that there's a company and they've got their own on-premises object storage system, but it can also send the data out to a cloud provider's object storage as well. So on that one platform, the administrators can choose where they want the data to be actually saved. They can have some of it on premises. They can have some of it out at the cloud provider. They can also replicate and have it in both locations as well. Some characteristics of object storage. Each object contains three things. The actual data itself, like that photo or video, customizable metadata, and a globally unique identifier. Those second two things we will talk about a bit more now. So first up, the metadata. So with object storage, it's not like your block storage, which really doesn't have metadata, or your NAS storage where the metadata is fixed. With object storage, the metadata is fully customizable. So you can add your own custom attributes about that actual data. It links directly with the object and contains those additional descriptive properties. This can be used for, first good thing about it, better indexing. For example, we could add custom metadata to a photo that says black and cats and cat. And then if you're searching for that photo or a video later, you can search for it. So think like YouTube would be a great example. When people upload videos to YouTube, 
Obviously, NAS would be a terrible choice for that, where they have to try to keep everything organized in a single folder, and that's how they find it. Because, it, you know, it's a big, huge store of really unstructured data. People just upload their videos to YouTube. But when you upload a YouTube to, a video to YouTube, you can put a tag on there. And then when later, pe later when people are searching for videos, if they're searching for your tags, then your video is going to come up in search. So that's a really good example of object storage. So if you've got a huge store of unstructured media, like photos or videos, then object storage is a great fit for it because you can have that customizable metadata on there, which makes it much easier for indexing and search. Another example would be for the medical industry. Like if you are uploading medical records or x-rays about a particular patient, the metadata could include the patient's name and the injury type in there. If you think again with NAS, you could put those things both in the file name, but your file name would get crazy long if you wanted to put all that different information in there. It would be very unwieldy. It really just wouldn't work. So for indexing and search, when you've got a large amount of unstructured data, object storage is perfect for that. Another benefit you get with this customizable metadata is it can be used for better management. For example, indicating replication instructions. So with object storage, you can have multiple nodes in the same data center. You can also have nodes for the same bucket spread across multiple data centers as well. So this is very good for having multiple copies of the data. So you don't need to have that offsite backup. It's already built into the system anyway. And with the metadata, you can put tags on there, whereas the administrator, you can control where it's going to be replicated. So maybe there's, there's one object that it's not very high value. You're quite happy with just having one copy of it. Maybe there's another object where you want it to be replicated multiple times within the same data center. Maybe another object you want it to be replicated between different data centers. With our customizable metadata, we can tag the objects with that, which is then going to control where it's going to get replicated. Another thing you could do with this is to help control moving objects to a different tier of storage. So you can have metadata tags on there where, and later on you can have a rule that says if this metadata is on there, I want it to be in my higher performance storage. If this metadata is on there, I want it to be on lower performance storage. And this can change over time. So you can change your rules and then that will take effect on everything that you've got in the object store. Another example we've got on here is when to actually delete that data. So all this kind of management task, where you want the data to be, how you want the data to be treated, you can control that with your metadata. It makes it very flexible. Okay, the last thing of the three things that we had with our object was a globally unique identifier. That is used instead of a file name and path like we have with our NAS protocols. The globally unique identifier, as the name suggests, is unique across the entire namespace. And it's used to find the object over the distributed system without having to know the physical location of the data. So it's not tied to a particular path. That removes the complexity and scalability challenges of a NAS hierarchical file system, which is based on complex file paths. Okay, so let's talk about some of the other characteristics of object storage. First up, data protection, which I did touch on just a minute ago. So object stores provide resiliency through replication and or erasure coding. Replication is used to store objects on multiple nodes, which can be in the same data center or in different data centers. That's very suitable for small files. You, not so good for large files. If you've got really big files and you're replicating with multiple copies everywhere, then that's going to take up a lot of space. There is another way that we can provide redundancy for those though, and that was our erasure, in, erasure coding. So with erasure coding, the object is broken up into smaller distributed parts. Parity information allows the data to be reconstructed if there is a node failure. So this is more suitable for larger files. So erasure coding, it's kind of similar to RAID, right? Remember with RAID that we covered earlier on our disks where we're striping the data across multiple disks? Well, with erasure coding, we stripe the object across multiple different nodes. And if any of the nodes 
is lost, we can still reconstruct that object from the parity information, similar to what we have with RAID. Obviously, that's suitable for larger files because rather than replicating that big, large file everywhere, we break it up into little smaller chunks and we replicate the chunks everywhere and we can still get it back if we lose any of our nodes. So with both the replication and the erasure coding, if one or more nodes fail, the data can still be made available without the application or the end user knowing anything about that. They just get their data as if nothing had happened. Next thing about object storage is versioning. So object storage supports versioning where the old version of the object can be automatically saved if it is changed. Yeah, the way that object storage works when changes are made is different to how it works with a NAS file system. It does not typically support file locking and files can't be updated in place that's what makes a simple data protection possible. Okay, so up to this point, you maybe thought, well, everything is great about object storage. Why would I even use NAS anymore? Why don't we just use object storage for everything? Well, object storage is not suitable when you've got data that is going to be edited by lots of different people and you want to have a, a single master copy of that. So again, going back to example of a Word document, so that you're, you're running a project, you've got a Word document about that and it gets edited by multiple people. Well, you want to have just one copy of that document. So with our NAS file systems, it supports file locking to make sure that there's one consistent copy. It prevents multiple people from changing the same thing at the same time. And you always have just that one master copy. With object storage, it's different. It doesn't support file locking. It doesn't support like in-place editing. So if you've got multiple users that are editing the file and making changes, what happens is you just end up with multiple different copies of that object. And if you think back to that project Word file, that would be really difficult to manage. So that's not a good use case for object storage. The, the big reason that it does work like that, though, is it makes the replication easy. Because we don't have that file lock in, having to keep that one master copy, we can just replicate it off to different places and it'll work just fine. If so like I said, if multiple users update the same object concurrently, the system will simply write different versions of the object. What versioning does is it gives you some data protection in that if somebody does overwrite an object or edit it, if you turn this on, it will automatically save the old version so you don't lose that data. So object storage is designed for puts and gets. So putting data there and taking the data back again, not for actually editing it. So not for data which will have multiple edits for multiple users, such as transactional databases, or Office Word documents. So the way that it works like that is traditionally made it more suitable for secondary, like backup and archive, rather than primary data. So if you've got data and you've just you've made it, it's not really going to be edited later, but you want to be able to get it back if need be, good use case for object storage. Next characteristic is cost. Object storage is typically used as secondary storage, like we just said, like backup and archive, where performance is not a priority. It's usually one of the lowest cost storage options from a cloud provider, again, because it's not typically designed for high performance. You can have high performance object storage if you want to, but in most cases, that's not the actual use case. On-premises object storage platforms can typically be bought as an appliance or software only. Again, this is another thing about the cost. So you, when you buy an appliance, that means that you, when you buy it from the vendor, it comes as the hardware platform, like the server, and the software is running on there too. Or typically, you can normally buy it as software only, and you install it on your own hardware. So if you're going to have a lot of nodes geographically dispersed, you can put it on low cost commodity server hardware, helps keep the costs down. All right, let's talk about the object storage protocol. So you know with our SAN protocols, that is fiber channel, iSCSI, fiber channel over ethernet and NVMe OF. And with NAS, we've got SIFS, SMB, which basically means the same thing, and NFS. With object storage, does not use those protocols. Object storage uses RESTful APIs, which means it's using HTTP requests to get, put, post, and delete data. So get 
gets the data from the system, put in post, puts it there, and delete obviously deletes it. And you can use a head to request metadata information about the object. When you're browsing the internet using HTTP, it's using these same commands as well. So it's, it's just like a web application. When things are accessing the object storage, that will often be an application accessing it directly and it will use an API, an application programming interface. There have been open standard APIs developed to help develop object storage across the industry. So some examples of our open standard APIs is, first one is CDMI, which is the Cloud Data Management Interface. That comes from the Storage Networking Industry Association, which is, in, which is the SNIA. To be honest, there is less uptake with the CDMI now. You'll more often see the next two being used, which is S3 and OpenStack Swift. So next one is S3. S3 is actually object storage that you can buy from Amazon, from AWS. But the S3 APIs have also been made available publicly. So if you've got another vendor like NetApp or IBM or Dell EMC or whoever who are making uh, a, an object storage platform, which companies can buy and put on their own premises, well, that can use S3 as well. It doesn't have to have anything to do with S3. So S3 is very commonly used. Obviously, it is used by Amazon S3, but it can also be used by other vendors as well. A benefit that comes from this is that often companies, if they are going to have on-premises, they're also going to want that to be a hybrid solution where they can use a cloud provider as well, like AWS. So if that on-premises solution is using S3, obviously that makes it very easy to integrate it with AWS because it's already using the same APIs. And the other one that's commonly used is OpenStack Swift. OpenStack is a big industry thing to try to get open standards mostly for cloud services and swift is the object storage part of that so s3 and openstack swift are probably the, the most commonly used apis and if you do have an on-premises system quite likely it will support both s3 and openstack swift as well and possibly also cdmi and users so like i just said often it will be applications accessing the storage directly and there will be applications written where if something happens they're going to put some data in the object storage or if something else happens we'll maybe get data out of there end users can usually access the storage directly as well via a web interface obviously a web interface is well built for this because it's using web commands or an application that is designed to be used directly by an end user such as cyberduck Support for access via NAS protocols is typically also included as well. That can either be built into the platform from the vendor, or it can be via a cloud gateway. The way a cloud gateway works is it sits between the clients and the object storage. The clients talk to the... So this will normally be a, a hardware appliance or a virtual machine. The clients talk to the cloud gateway using standard NAS protocols like SMB or NFS. And then the cloud gateway converts that to object storage APIs on the other side. So it acts uh, as an interface between the clients and the object storage. So they can talk NAS and then it talks object storage on the back end. Okay, so let's summarize the benefits of object storage. It's a single namespace with almost infinite scale that can be sailed across multiple physical locations. Performance does not degrade as it gets bigger. Next thing, customizable metadata for better indexing and management. It supports data management functions such as replication at the object gr level granularity. So you don't have to set it for the entire bucket. Individual objects in there can have their own policies applied to them. And typically, but it doesn't have to be, it will be low cost. The limitations with object storage, it is generally lower cost, which means lower performance. So it's not suitable for databases or other applications which require high performance. It doesn't have locking and file sharing facilities. So it's not suitable for data, which may be accessed concurrently and changed by multiple users or applications. So where, where is it used? 
It's best suited as a massively scalable store for unstructured data that's updated infrequently. So think like YouTube. It can be used as an additional storage tier beyond transactional storage for inactive data or as archival storage. So you can have your primary storage system, which is providing the performance, and then you can then tear that data off to the object storage as well behind that. As object storage evolves, it may become more suitable to primary data. It is newer than SAN and NAS. There will be changes happening to it. So it will evolve over time and there will be other use cases that will come out over time as well. It's well suited for file content in the cloud space, especially images and videos. Some use case examples, so yeah, media. Like I just said, think like YouTube, not just YouTube, also media companies as well. If they are producing a lot of media like photos and videos, maybe also need to do transcoding on there as well. Object storage is a great place for them to store it. Also medical, we spoke about the medical records and the x-rays earlier. And this is something that can be a huge amount of unstructured data. It's really not going to be touched after it's produced. And having that customable metadata makes it great for the indexing. Another example is oil and gas, like seismic data. It, it's, it can be very large, it's unstructured, and normally after it, it's, it's created, it's not going to be edited and changed by people. So again, object storage is a good fit for that. Some examples of object storage, cloud providers, the most famous one is Amazon Web Services S3, which is a simple storage service. Microsoft Azure also have their object storage as well. There's proprietary implementations. So Facebook, if you think about them, they've got a huge amount of photos on there. Perfect example of a use case for object storage. They developed their own one, which is called Haystack. There are also those on-premises and hybrid solutions. An example of one from NetApp is Storage Grid. Okay, so that was it for our object storage and see you in the next one.